HWAS Weekly is on the move to this year's Senior Fest. Thanks for visiting our display, and be sure to visit our AgeWise Weekly Underwriters, Blue Cross of Western Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania Blue Shield, St. Margaret's Hospital, and Port Authority Transit. If you're enjoying today's Senior Fest celebration of older Americans, then you're just the right person to tune into WQEX 16. I'm Eleanor Shano, host of AgeWise Weekly, inviting you to join me for this city's only live how-to and information show for the over 50 set. Each Wednesday at 8 p.m., you can call us live for the health, social, political, and entertainment information that matters to you. And catch AgeWise AM each weekday morning at 8, plus AgeWise extras throughout the day. Enjoy your day at the Senior Fest and join me on WQEX 16 for AgeWise, brought to you by Blue Cross of Western Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania Blue Shield, St. Margaret's Hospital, and Port Authority Transit. Mobile homes are one of the few remaining sources of affordable housing for older Americans. Escondido, California is trying to keep it that way. After rents jumped by as much as 100%, voters passed a rent control ordinance which limits the rent mobile home park owners can charge for the spaces. The mobile home coach owner has a substantial investment in their home, but their home is sitting on someone else's land. So the person that owns the land, in this case the park owner, immediately, because of the very nature of the relationship, has a substantial leverage over the coach owner. But the owner of this park says leverage is reversed under rent control. He has taken his complaint all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Bob Jugello argued the case. Uh, the value of his park was greatly diminished by a law that uh, transferred the basic value of the property from him when he bought it to his tenants. The park owner wants a portion of the rent control ordinance set aside so he can raise rents when present mobile home owners sell. So that the tenant can't sell the coach for a lot more than it's worth because they're really selling the space and the right to occupy it at a reduced rate. But older tenants argue they're not about to sell their mobile homes. The Walners are in their 80s. At this stage of their lives, they say they're not interested in selling to make a profit even if they wanted to. There's a shortage of mobile home parks in California. Well, you can't move your mobile home. There's no place to go. There's no spaces available. Besides Escondido, many other cities and states across the country have enacted laws protecting park residents from exorbitant rent hikes. If the high court rules in favor of park owners, this source of affordable housing for older Americans could be in jeopardy. I'm Peter Hackus reporting. Just to give you an example of some of these things that... Uh, if you're a scam artist yeah, hoping to make a fast, that, uh, easy buck off older Americans, you had better take Shelley Feldman and, uh, off your mailing list. Feldman is one of Florida's senior sleuths. Assistant State Attorney General Jack Norris explains the pilot project. This was a group of people that uh, we identified throughout the state uh, who were volunteers, senior volunteers, that collected mail, their junk mail, to find out uh, if there were, were laws being broken. Turnabout is fair play, since very often it's older people who are targeted by the con artists. They use all kinds of names and all kinds of gimmicks to get your attention, to open the mail, to get you to make that next step, which is to send them some money. Over a recent two-month period, enough evidence was collected to begin more than 100 criminal investigations. The Senior Sleuth Squad is part of Seniors vs. Crime, an innovative crime awareness and prevention program that started in Florida. First of all, we wanted to reinforce the message of crime prevention to the elderly. Secondly, we wanted to provide seminars for the elderly as to what they could be aware of, what they can look out for. Seniors versus Crime also has helped pass several new laws in Florida that increase penalties for crimes against seniors. The senior sleuths, meanwhile, have accepted their next assignment. This time, the Attorney General's office has asked them to be on the lookout for mail and telephone scams involving fake charities. I'm Peter Hackus reporting. After 62 years of marriage, Bill Burns had to make one of the toughest choices of his life, admitting his wife Clara into a nursing home. Clara has Alzheimer's disease. 
After a few short months, Bill Burns feels he made the right decision. Yeah, this is wonderful for her, and me too. Clara and 34 other Alzheimer's patients live in a special unit at the Colonial Nursing and Rehabilitation Center in Massachusetts. We tried to create a safe, a secure, and a stress-free environment. And this is something we can guarantee on that unit. Colonial is one of several nursing homes in the country that has created an innovative unit, ideal for the Alzheimer's patient. To minimize confusion, the unit includes patternless carpeting and wallpaper. Because Alzheimer patients are likely to remember colors, rooms and door frames are color coded. It allows them the chance to recognize their room. They see the door frame and then it carries on through so it's a, a soothing environment, one that doesn't create stress or anxiety. Glossless floors and mirrorless rooms also contribute to a stress-free environment and above every bed is a bulletin board with family pictures. If they get in the room and um, they see something on their bulletin board, it may very well identify that this is my space, this is my, my home. How many children? Making patients feel at home and comfortable is what this unit is all about. Unlike a conventional nursing home, scheduled meals and activities are optional. They really can do pretty much what they want. They can eat when they want. The environment is physically and chemically restraint free. None of the patients are on medication, which is another reason why Bill Burns feels comfortable with his wife, Clara, in a nursing home. I'm Doris McMillan reporting. AgeWise Weekly is on the move to this year's Senior Fest. Thanks for visiting our display, and be sure to visit our AgeWise Weekly underwriters, Blue Cross of Western Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania Blue Shield, St. Margaret's Hospital, and Port Authority Transit. If you're enjoying today's Senior Fest celebration of older Americans, then you're just the right person to tune into WQEX 16. I'm Eleanor Shano, host of AgeWise Weekly, inviting you to join me for this city's only live how-to and information show for the over 50 set. Each Wednesday at 8 p.m., you can call us live for the health, social, political, and entertainment information that matters to you. And catch AgeWise AM each weekday morning at 8, plus AgeWise extras throughout the day. Enjoy your day at the Senior Fest and join me on WQEX 16 for AgeWise, brought to you by Blue Cross of Western Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania Blue Shield, St. Margaret's Hospital, and Port Authority Transit. No doubt about it, we're all looking for the diet that will give us more energy, help us lose weight, feel better about our bodies. Well, tonight, my special guest on AgeWise Weekly is a doctor and author of a diet he says can help us all feel younger and look younger. It's called the anti-aging diet. We're going to tell you all about it and how it works and whether it's for you or not, all coming up on AgeWise Weekly next. I'm Eleanor Shano. I want to welcome you to AgeWise Weekly. My special guest in the studio tonight is Dr. Art Mullen. He's an author and fitness expert, and he's written a book called The Anti-Aging Diet. Now, as you well know, AgeWise Weekly is usually a live show, and we're always happy to have your phone-in questions. But tonight, the show is pre-recorded, so we're not going to be able to take your calls, but don't worry. I have a whole list of questions here for Dr. Mullen. He has a lot of great information to pass along, and we're going to get started. Welcome, Dr. Mullen. It's a pleasure to be here. We'll have to give him my number at the Southwest Health Institute in Phoenix so they can call me there. Great, and we'll, we'll all be out to Phoenix to visit you <laughs> exactly. in, a, in a heartbeat. This book and I told you I've been carrying it around for the past week because I've been I've been reading it and you can't imagine how provocative this title is people go oh anti-aging diet what's it all about well of what's course when they immediately hear that they think that all the wrinkles from their face are going to be magically uh, disappeared and uh, we can't necessarily do that for them but what we can do is actually cause the wrinkles from inside their body to disappear and those wrinkles being the effects on their kidney their liver their heart 
as well as their cholesterol level and their blood pressure and all of those things can be affected dramatically as well as facilitating an easy weight loss for people. So that's what the diet really does for people. Dr. Mullen, I think I recall at the checkout counter in the supermarket seeing one of those tabloids and it said, and it was referring to your diet, Yes, it was. live to be 120. Uh, a right. little bit of an That's exaggeration. Right. Well, interestingly enough, some of the research studies have suggested that by being on this particular anti-aging diet, you can actually extend the normal lifespan by 20 to 30 years. But some of the research studies on clinical laboratory animals have suggested that you can have the potential in humans to extend their lifespan to 120, simply because in the laboratory, they've shown that the animals have been able to double their lifespan. So we're saying that the average American male lives to 72, the average American female female lives to 78. Now if they could double that lifespan, we're talking about 140 years of what the potential is. And there have been existing cases, of course, in the United States of people living to the age of 120, 125, and so on. So it's, it's not really impossible. Okay, let's back up a little bit. Okay. How did you develop this diet? I started studying this diet myself because I wanted to enhance my overall athletic ability. I was training for the Boston Marathon. I wanted to run the Boston Marathon a, a little more quickly. So I decided that I would try different diets. And first I tried to add protein. And when I added protein, I saw that I was very fatigued and very tired and I didn't particularly perform well. So then I decided, well, I'd go in the opposite way and I'd increase carbohydrates and really decrease the protein. And it decreased my Boston Marathon time by 40 minutes from one year to the next. So at that point, I was very excited. I decided to try it on my patients. I started doing that about 15 years ago at my Southwest Health Institute, and everything is historical since then. What kind of research is, have you done on this diet? I mean, how do you right. know that it works? Well, what we do is we study the patients, and we evaluate their kidney studies. We evaluate their liver function. We take a look at their cholesterol. We look at their overall heart performance by max uh, VO2, which is their maximum oxygen uptake. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, Cornell University, in conjunction with Bayesian, Beijing University School of Preventive Medicine and Oxford University have done the Grand Prix study of epidemiology. They studied 6,500 Chinese over a nine-year period and they found that they had one-sixteenth the incidence of heart disease of Americans, one-fifth the incidence of breast cancer of Americans, one-fourth the incidence of colon cancer. They did not develop diabetes. None of the Chinese was overweight, yet they consumed more calories. Their average cholesterol was 127. Most Americans is 237. The common denominator of all of these Chinese was the fact that they followed a low protein diet. They were consuming about 7% of all of their protein from animal sources and the rest from vegetable sources in comparison to Americans who consume about 70% of their, of their protein from animal sources and about 30% from vegetable sources. So what I'm suggesting for people is to switch to more vegetable protein instead of the animal protein. The reason being it's much more difficult for the body to assimilate, digest, and excrete this, and that puts stress not only on your heart, on your liver, on your kidneys, and your pancreas. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, conventional medicine for the last 40 years has used this exact diet to treat patients who have kidney failure and are about to go on to kidney dialysis. They put them on this particular diet and they say, okay, you're not going to have dialysis because we're going to put you on this particular diet and it actually prevents them from having a deterioration of their kidneys long term. So I'm taking it one step further and I'm treating people with heart disease, high cholesterol, diabetes, hypoglycemia, chronic fatigue syndrome, hypertension. All of those people are being treated with this exact diet and this will become axiomatic for physicians in the 21st century to use this particular diet for their, for their patients. It will be the benchmark for physicians when prescribing a healthy diet for all patients to use. You really believe then that you are a visionary and you're on the cutting edge of, of the diet This for the is the breakthrough century. for nutritional medicine in the 21st century. Yes, I do believe in it. I practice it myself. Uh, in addition to that, there are other components of anti-aging. So it's not as simple. Okay. The, the formula isn't a simple two plus two equals four. It's a little more complex than that. All right, we, we, we want to get into the specifics of the diet. Yes. Uh, you say that there are other components. I know you stress exercise, but you stress exercise in, in a slightly different kind of way. Uh, you say that moderate exercise is the best way to go, but you must exercise every day. Now, I know lots of people that really work out very hard. Sure. Three times a week. Exactly. And that's it. 
Well, most people and, and a lot of the experts in the exercise field will say you can exercise three times a week. You can exercise five times a week. I'm suggesting to people that if you're putting energy into the body, eating, mm -hmm. then you have to expend energy out of the system by simply exercising. And that exercise should be an aerobic exercise, but a minimal amount. And now the research studies, at one time they said, you have to elevate your heart rate up to 70% of your maximum right. oxygen right. output in order to get the beneficial effect. Now they're saying you can elevate it just 40 or 50% and still get a beneficial effect on your heart and lungs. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, when I evaluate patients at my institute and we put them on a treadmill, they are surprised and shocked to find that their pulse rate elevates so high high and that they can exercise in such an easy fashion and still get that beneficial effect. I suggest exercise every day and the main reason is it elevates your metabolism for six to eight hours after you've exercised. Burns so you're, calories, you're burning right? burning calories by sitting in this chair uh, and someone else wouldn't. Okay, why are you still running? <laughs> well, I, addicted, right? I'm, I'm addicted to it, but it makes me feel good. It, it, makes, it allows me to function at the pinnacle of my creativity and my productivity every day. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm at a 10 every day instead of a minus 2 reaching up to touch bottom. <laughs> You're sure at a 10 right now. Okay, we're talking uh, with Dr. Mullen. He is the author of The Anti-Aging Diet. We've uh, teased you enough. We're going to take a short break, and we're going to come back and tell you what it's really all about. Edgewise Weekly is on the move to this year's Senior Fest. Thanks for visiting our display, and be sure to visit our Edgewise Weekly underwriters, Blue Cross of Western Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania Blue Shield, St. Margaret's Hospital, and Port Authority Transit. If you're enjoying today's Senior Fest celebration of older Americans, then you're just the right person to tune into WQEX 16. I'm Eleanor Shano, host of Agewise Weekly, inviting you to join me for this city's only live how-to and information show for the over 50 set. Each Wednesday at 8 p.m., you can call us live for the health, social, political, and entertainment information that matters to you. And catch Agewise AM each weekday morning at 8, plus Agewise extras throughout the day. Enjoy your day at the Senior Fest and join me on WQEX 16 for AgeWise, brought to you by Blue Cross of Western Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania Blue Shield, St. Margaret's Hospital, and Port Authority Transit. This is high intensity exercise. And while some older people enjoy the benefits of aerobics, many are just not able to do these exercises. One, get those knees up. But a new exercise program called SMILE is aimed at helping older adults who've been physically inactive or are limited in their mobility. And it was designed to help them improve their abilities to do the ordinary things in their everyday lives, like getting up and down out of a chair and up and down steps and in and out of bed. Front, right, back, left. SMILE stands for so much improvement with a little exercise. It is based on research that proves that even frail older people gain substantial benefit from gentle exercise movements. This is for us because uh, uh, we all have some kind of infirmities and uh, it, we do as much as you can and if you uh, get tired or if it aches, you stop. And besides the physical benefits, the SMILE program helps to stimulate mental processes too. This exercise class really helps. When you feel down in the dumps, you come here, you laugh, you go out, you feel perky. Everybody got their pulse? They feel better. Their overall quality of life is good. Uh, their participation in the exercises is very high, higher than most uh, other age groups, which suggests that they really enjoy it. In fact, these seniors say that twice a week they look forward to their classes and to exercising with a smile. I'm Peter Hackes reporting. When you open a newspaper and see advertisements like these, turn the page. That's what consumer experts recommend if you're tempted to call a credit repair clinic that promises to clean up your credit report. And a lot of these disreputable firms run these advertisements, especially in tough economic times like this, and, and offer to do that. They, they, in fact, cannot do that. After Judy Smith of Ohio lost her job, she that turned to a credit repair that clinic that for help. That it's just a waste of time and energy and money. And we found that out the hard way, I guess. 
The credit repair company charged Judy $750 to fix her credit report. Yeah. The contract promised results within 18 months. But nothing was done to fix her credit report. Judy took the company to court and was lucky to recover half of her investment. Unfortunately, what happens is uh, these, these businesses, so-called businesses, uh, are, are there only for a short period of time. They have a number that they use for people to call and they might be there for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and then that phone is disconnected and they're gone. North Carolina's Assistant Attorney General Philip Lehman recently succeeded in passing a law to reduce these scams. That prevents a, prohibits a credit repair company from taking an advance fee. They can't take any money from you until they've rendered some actual services. But federal officials say this just pushes the problem next door. And until there are new federal laws, officials can only offer this advice. There are no magic solutions. If you have a credit problem, it probably isn't going to be solved by answering an ad in a newspaper. You just have to start the slow process of building your credit back up. And consumer experts say you can start by getting help from consumer credit counseling centers located all over the country. I'm Doris McMillan reporting. Regina Northup has no family history of breast cancer. She did monthly self-exams and never detected a lump. But still, Regina felt compelled to have a mammogram. Part of why I finally decided it is I need to go it was there was a lot of publicity. You know, it said one out of nine women, and I thought, hmm, one out of nine women is started counting off the houses on this block. <laughs> Regina passed a doctor's breast exam, but her mammogram detected breast cancer. And I sat there, but not me. They must be a mistake. It couldn't be. It couldn't. And then he started talking about what do we have to do next and what are your options. And, and I said, I don't even hear what you're saying, doctor. I, you know, I just have to absorb what you said before. The risk of breast cancer increases with age. But studies show the likelihood of an older woman having a mammogram decreases with age. Medicare now helps pay the cost of screening mammograms. The basic coverage for women over 65, the, the normal Medicare, the regular Medicare population is every other year you can have a mammogram for screening purposes. No reason to think there's a problem, but you're doing this just to make sure. A recent American Association of Retired Persons survey says 70% of women over 65 are unaware of the new Medicare benefit. So be tested regularly. You owe it to yourself. To make sure women get the word, AARP and the Department of Health and Human Services are kicking off a mammography awareness campaign. We've got to make sure people understand warning signs, they pay attention, uh, they're good consumers, and that they know they have this important benefit and use it. Regina Northup may owe her life to a screening mammogram. She tries to convince other women to have a mammogram because she knows how important early detection is. As long as you're still feeling good, you know, there may be something there starting to grow. And then when you, when you start feeling not so good anymore, it's too late to do anything about it. I'm Doris McMillan reporting. AgeWise Weekly is on the move to this year's Senior Fest. Thanks for visiting our display, and be sure to visit our AgeWise Weekly Underwriters, Blue Cross of Western Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania Blue Shield, St. Margaret's Hospital, and Port Authority Transit. If you're enjoying today's Senior Fest celebration of older Americans, then you're just the right person to tune into WQEX 16. I'm Eleanor Shano, host of AgeWise Weekly, inviting you to join me for this city's only live how-to and information show for the over 50 set. Each Wednesday at 8 p.m., you can call us live for the health, social, political, and entertainment information that matters to you. And catch AgeWise AM each weekday morning at 8, plus AgeWise Extras throughout the day. Enjoy your day at the Senior Fest and join me on WQEX 16 for AgeWise, brought to you by Blue Cross of Western Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania Blue Shield, St. Margaret's Hospital, and Port Authority Transit. I will be the first one to buy it. The fantastic idea belongs to 16-year-old Wayne Walker. He has designed a special can opener that makes it easier for people with arthritis to open cans. See, that's all for all the people. This, what is this? This is a, wheel, a wheelchair. A reclining wheelchair, a temperature control shower, and a stair climbing walker are just a few creative ideas conceived by Miami high school students. They're part of an intergenerational program called Design 2000. 
Design 2000 is a project that we're utilizing the skills of older adults and high school students to look at um, creating assistive devices that will help older people remain independent as long as possible. The project includes meeting with the elderly for some feedback, which the students enjoy most. They don't just talk about the design, but they talk about their lives and about school and about their future, and a really nice relationship starts to develop. Design 2000 has made both generations more sensitive to each other. Nice to see a young person like that understanding the situation and trying to do something about it. They learn that we are sincere in what we do when we do it, and most of them want to see us again. 16-year-old Patrick O'Brien is constructing his design. His book holder with a built-in magnifier and page turner won first prize in the Design 2000 competition. Second prize goes to Eloise President for a special wrist gear to anchor a spoon or fork. Both teenagers say the real prize is what they've learned from the elderly. I learned to respect them more because one day I might be that age and, you know, I would want somebody my age to help me exactly like I was helping them. The students are hoping the Design 2000 program will catch on throughout the country. I'm Doris McMillan reporting. Ready, set, go. One, two, three. This couple is taking a driver's five, test, not the kind you need six, for a license, but one that seven, will help them assess their driving eight. skills as they grow older. That's it. People may be under the impression that there is a magic age at which someone becomes a bad driver. I mean, I believe that um, if you're once a bad driver, you're always a bad driver. But picking an age is arbitrary and it's discriminatory. There is no magic age at which someone becomes a bad driver. This is AARP's Older Drivers Skill Assessment and Resource Guide. It's full of user-friendly tests you can take easily at home. Okay, I'll read it. You mark it down, Carmen to see if I had it right. First line, O-R-S, second line, Z-H. The tests are designed to help older drivers measure their vision, their reaction time, their awareness. The results can be a reality check. Fifth line. When you have your near misses, you don't want to admit that it was a near hit. But when you read it in here, you begin to get an idea. The handbook also shows how aging can affect your driving. For example, how your useful field of view shrinks over time. The idea of being able to identify your risk factors and being able to compensate or regulate or change your driving based on that is what we're trying to do, help people do that themselves. The idea is not to get older drivers off the road. Instead, it's to help them continue driving safely as long as they are capable. I'm Peter Hackus reporting. Esther Plotkin has lived in the same house for 30 years now, and she wants to keep it that way. That's why she's taken steps to reduce her chances of falling and breaking a hip. For a woman over age 65, the chance of that happening during her lifetime is one in five. And it's important to note that most hip fractures occur in the home so that most of our campaign is oriented to how people can have a very safe home environment and avoid having hip fractures. There are a number of things you can do to make your home safer. For example, make sure there's plenty of light around stairways and halls. Bathrooms are easily adapted. Well, here in my bathroom, I've installed both a removable bar and a permanent bar as a safety precaution. Mrs. Plotkin also keeps a walker on each floor, not so much for support as for balance. Her floors are free from clutter, and there are no loose rugs. And I know that my bones are not in great shape, that uh, I have to be cautious in, in what I do. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons wishes everyone had that same attitude. That's why the group has launched the Live It Safe campaign. The problem is that almost everyone who has, has a hip fracture will either require nursing home care or extended care by their family or friends. They will need to use a walker or a cane at least for a year after the injury and sometimes forever.
There's no place Esther Plotkin feels more comfortable than at home. By living it safe, the longer she'll likely stay there. I'm John Nestor reporting.